Hello again and welcome to Advanced Physics for High School Students. This is Lesson 14 and it is entitled Heat, Specific Heat, and Calorimetry. In this lesson we take up the topic of thermodynamics, continuing with the ideas begun in Lesson 6 where we encountered kinetic theory and temperature. So far in physics we've been working in the area of mechanics. In our analogy of basketball practice we're working on another subdiscipline. We'll come back to mechanics again soon, and as the course progresses, we'll be jumping around to other disciplines, honing our skills and spiraling to more complex topics. You should recognize several important historical figures in the realm of thermodynamics. Perhaps the first to mention is James Prescott Joule from England. Joule conducted experiments to measure what is now known as the mechanical equivalent of heat, in which he built a contraption that connected a set of falling weights to a paddle wheel stirrer that was immersed in water. He was able to measure the mechanical work done on the falling weights based on their mass and the distance that they fell, and he measured the rise in the temperature of the water stirred by the paddle wheel. He related the mechanical work done on the paddle wheel to the amount of heat absorbed by the water due to the stirring action and gave us a numerical relationship between work and heat. The unit of mechanical work is named in his honor. Another fellow you should recognize is French engineer Sadi Carnot, who developed the theory behind what we'll come to call the ideal or the Carnot engine. We'll encounter the Carnot engine later in this course. Another fellow is German Rudolf Clausius, who put thermodynamics on a sound mathematical basis. Clausius gave us one of the first early statements of the second law of thermodynamics, which we'll handle later in the course. Another Englishman, William Thompson, was also known as Lord Kelvin. Kelvin determined an accurate value of absolute zero on the Celsius or centigrade scale. Thompson also participated in the laying of the first transatlantic telegraph cable, a feat that helped earn his knighting. Another important figure who we'll hardly encounter at all in this course is Austrian Ludwig Boltzmann. Boltzmann developed the field of statistical mechanics and the fundamental thermodynamic quantity known as Boltzmann's constant, which is related to the ideal gas constant R, is named for him. In thermodynamics, we'll have to grapple with two sets of energy units. The calorie, with a little c, which is also known as the gram calorie, is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one centigrade degree. You'll notice I've written one centigrade degree with the centigrade unit first followed by the degree as opposed to one degree centigrade. The point is that when we're discussing temperature differences, we use centigrade degrees, whereas when we're interested in specific points on the temperature scale, we use degrees centigrade. This is important because when we use the centigrade or the Celsius scale and the absolute temperature or Kelvin scale, the size of the temperature steps on each scale is identical, even though the numbers on the scale start in different places. So when we use equations involving temperature differences, delta t's, then the delta t on the Celsius scale and the delta t on the Kelvin scale will be identical in size. Here in the United States, you'll hear some people talk about food calories with an uppercase letter C, which is equal to 1,000 little c calories. You're unlikely to see this unit, the big C calorie, on the College Board exam, but since it's out there in popular culture, I thought I'd mention it. In other nations, the food energy unit is the kilojoule. Coined by the French from the Latin word caloric, meaning heat, chemists use the calorie for their measurements. The caloric theory of heat postulated a self-repellent weightless gas called caloric that could pass in and out of pores of solids and liquids and that flowed from hotter bodies to colder bodies. The caloric theory is now obsolete, superseded by the 19th century mechanical theory of heat, but it persisted in scientific literature until late in the 19th century. The, the dominant energy unit that we'll use in this course is the joule. Numerically, James Prescott Joule measured the equivalence between calories and joules. That relationship is one that you'll use quite a bit in this course. One calorie is equal to 4.186 joules. 
For calculation purposes, we'll usually round this to 4.2 joules per calorie. Now, you'll notice I've been using the term thermal energy and have avoided the word heat. Eventually, we'll have to wrestle with both of these concepts, so let's define the words precisely. At the microscopic level, the particles in a substance are moving, whether they're jiggling back and forth around some central spot in the case of a solid, or they're moving with larger excursions, slipping past each other and rotating and vibrating in the case of liquids, or maybe they're just flying past each other in gases. All of these particles possess kinetic energy. If I were to add up the kinetic energies from all the particles in the substance, the sum would be what we call the thermal energy, or the internal energy of the substance. Mathematically, we'll symbolize internal energy or thermal energy using the capital letter U. Now when we say a substance is hot or cold, we're talking about the temperature of a substance. And for calculation purposes, we'll be most interested in the absolute temperature of the substance. The absolute temperature is directly proportional to the average kinetic energy of the particles in the substance. Some of the particles will have more than the average kinetic energy, and some will have less than the average kinetic energy. But we can talk about the average kinetic energy, and the absolute temperature gives us a means of indicating the amount of average kinetic energy of the particles. Now, if we take two objects that are at different temperatures, and I place them in thermal contact with each other, in other words, I touch them in some way that they can exchange energy, then thermal energy will flow from the hot substance to the cold substance. The particles in the cooler object will become more energized as the result of this energy flow, and the cooler substance will warm up while the warmer substance cools down until at last they reach the same temperature and their particles possess the same average amount of kinetic energy. Now we call the thermal energy that flows between these objects heat. Thermal energy naturally flows from the hot toward the cold until thermal equilibrium is reached. So objects don't possess heat. Rather, objects contain thermal energy. And when that thermal energy passes from one object to another, we call that transferred thermal energy by the word heat. Mathematically, we symbolize heat with a capital letter Q to represent quantity of heat. Q is a number that represents the amount of thermal energy that leaves one object and enters another object as a result of a difference in the temperatures between the objects. Now, we defined the calorie as the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one centigrade degree. The calorie is defined using water because water is a common and necessary substance for sustaining life. Other substances, such as aluminum or copper or wood or any other substance, will require a different amount of energy to raise one of their grams by one centigrade degree. The reason for these different energies isn't too hard to understand. Different substances have different structures at the microscopic level, and so it shouldn't be surprising that energy will cause them to behave differently when they're absorbed, when that energy is absorbed. Each individual substance has its own something that we'll call specific heat, which is symbolized with a lowercase c. Your textbook in Lesson 14 contains a table showing the specific heats of various substances using various units. The specific heat of water is one calorie per gram per centigrade degree. In other words, that's the definition of a calorie. But other substances have specific heats that are different. The specific heat, say, of aluminum is a number which is less than one calorie per gram per centigrade degree. And in fact, most substances will have specific heats that are less than the specific heat of water. Water has a very high specific heat. So when we talk about the specific heat of a substance, we mean the amount of thermal energy which one gram of that substance must absorb in order to increase the temperature of one gram of that substance by one centigrade degree. The total amount of heat a substance absorbs or releases during thermal contact depends on several factors. It depends on how much of the substance there is, which is related to the mass. It depends on the composition of the substance, which is related to the specific heat. And it depends on the change in temperature the substance experiences, or delta T. The relationship that constitutes one of the most important equations of this lesson is this. Q is equal to mc delta T. 
The delta T is the difference between the final and the initial temperatures. If a substance releases heat, then Q will be negative, whereas if the substance absorbs heat, then Q will be a positive number. So the sign of the Q tells us something about which way the heat moves. One of the ways that specific heats of various substances is measured is through a technique known as the method of mixtures. Experimentally, the device used to make these measurements is called a calorimeter, and these diagrams show calorimeters. On the left side is a photograph showing the parts of a student calorimeter, and the right diagram shows a schematic of the different parts. There's the outer vessel, which insulates the experiment from heat exchanges with the outside. The inner vessel holds the water and the sample that are exchanging heat during the experiment. The stirrer agitates the water, ensuring good thermal contact throughout. The stirrer fits through the lid, which also helps to insulate the experiment from the outside. Not shown in the left diagram is a thermometer that fits through a hole in the lid to measure the water temperature inside the inner vessel. Now, I don't care for the way your authors state the equation for the method of mixtures, and so I'm going to write it differently. The way I'll write it is basically a statement of the principle of conservation of energy. It says that all the thermal energy contained in the system stays in the system. Whatever gains heat got its energy from whatever loses heat inside the calorimeter. Mathematically, we say that Q loss plus Q gain equals zero. Now we're ready to apply all this to solving a particular numerical problem. Example 14.4. To determine the specific heat of a new alloy, a 0.15 kilogram sample of the alloy is heated to 540 degrees Celsius. It is then quickly placed into 0.4 kilograms of water at 10 degrees Celsius, which is in a 0.2 kilogram aluminum calorimeter. The equilibrium temperature of the alloy, water, and calorimeter is found to be 31 degrees Celsius. Calculate the specific heat of the alloy. In this problem, we have three objects that are exchanging heat. We have the alloy, which starts out to be hot. We have the water, and we have the inner vessel of the calorimeter, and those are going to be absorbing energy. Let's use subscripts to represent each one. The principle of conservation of energy says that all of the heat stays in the system. So when I add up all the Q's, they are equal to zero. Each of those substances is made up of a certain mass, each has a certain specific heat, and there's going to be a certain change in temperature of everything. Q is equal to mc delta T. So now I want to put all that together. I want to talk about the things that are losing energy, the things that are gaining energy. Everything stays in the same system. The final temperature of the alloy and the water and the calorimeter cup, I'm calling TF. They're all going to be in thermal equilibrium, and so they're all going to have the same final temperature. When I look at this equation, I know everything in this equation except for the specific heat of the alloy. And so what I want to do is I want to put in the numbers and I want to find what is the specific heat of that alloy. Here we go. And now I solve that equation. I'm going to use my TI solve. I get that the specific heat of the alloy is just under 512 joules per kilogram centigrade degree. In other words, if I wanted to raise one kilogram of this particular alloy by one centigrade degree, I would have to pump in 512 joules of energy in order to do that. So recapping, what we've done is we've looked at heat, specific heat, and calorimetry. We have been introduced some, to some historical figures. We've talked about the difference between heat and thermal energy, the difference in the different type of units that we are going to encounter, calories and joules. We have dealt with calorimetry, and we've solved a numerical problem. For now, that's it.